we're here to talk to you about cryptocurrency and commerce, how to build a non-custodial online payment processor. And so like I said, I'm currently at Coinbase. I joined last year as a software engineer. I live out in San Francisco. Okay, so uh, I think that there's two groups of people here in general. There's a group of you who are asking what's cryptocurrency, like what is it useful for, and then the other half of you who spend all your time explaining to everyone else what cryptocurrency is. <laughs> so I, saw, I followed up this tweet that I thought was kind of funny. If I had a Bitcoin for every time someone tried to explain Bitcoins to me, I have a lot of Bitcoin and still no idea what to do with them. <laughs> So cryptocurrency is a digital currency that uses cryptography to regulate the sending and receiving of funds, the transfer and creation of the currency, independently of a central bank. Um, and so one thing that really drew me to Coinbase and cryptocurrency was this idea that if you can generate a random number, then you can be your own bank. So this really appealed to me because in a lot of places in the world, it's, most of the world, multi-billion people are unbanked. But with crypto, you don't have to register your account number, your password, your private key with anyone. You could literally be offline and flip a quarter 256 times and then you own your private key. And this was uh, really important. So in 2009, I read the book Digital Gold and they talked about how Bitcoin was uh, adopted by a lot of Argentinians because they were going through massive hyperinflation. And so a lot of the wealthy are moving their money out of Argentinian pesos and into Bitcoin. And I think that's a concept that's hard to appreciate for a lot of people who live in the Western world where the US dollar is the standard across other nations. And so um, one thing that I like to think about is this idea of Finance 1.0. And so Coinbase mission is to build Finance 2.0. And so like, if you want to start accepting and selling goods on the internet, it's actually really complicated. So first, you need to register your business with the US government. And then with that business number, you need to go to a bank account. The bank account has to, the bank has to approve of what you're selling. And then after that, you have to go online with Stripe and PayPal. And then they also have to approve of what you're doing. And that's only to accept US dollars from people in America. It gets a lot more complicated if you want to do commerce across borders. Um, and so the premise of this talk is how do we build an online payment processor that doesn't rely on a middleman to settle funds, that doesn't have any sort of intermediary or escrow where the funds are held. So how can we build a payment processor that's totally non-custodial? And so the first thing I want to start with is the idea of a key. So every key is a pair. It's a private key and a public key. And so a lot of you have probably seen this. You see like a private key and then you have a Bitcoin address. And so there's a relationship between the private key, the public key, and the Bitcoin address. And so um, big K equals little k times G. So uh, K is your integer, your random number that you generated from flipping your coin a bunch of times. And then K is a point on a curve and G is a constant. And so um, they call it cryptocurrency because of this elliptic curve cryptography. And so the actual curve is really complicated, but we'll just use like a, an example of an elliptic curve. And so the idea with the K times little equals little K times G is that you are taking your random number K, this is like your, your password, your private key, and you're multiplying the point G K times, right? And so that's like adding K plus K plus K plus, or sorry, G plus G plus G, K number of times. And so the relationship is that given your random number K that you've generated, you can plot, apply a one-way cryptographic multiplication function to get big K, your public key, but in order for you to go from big K back to your private key, you can't. It would take some, something like two to the 128th operations. Like it's a really, it's basically impossible to go to given a public key, figure out what the private key is. And that's like one of the key security principles of cryptocurrency. Um, and then from the public key, you just do a little hashing function. So just a Bitcoin address. And so Bitcoin addresses are what is how you receive money on the blockchain, right? And so when you show someone your Bitcoin address, they send money to the Bitcoin address and that money is stored on the blockchain. You spend money with, uh, you spend money and move money out of that Bitcoin address using your private key, little k. Um, and so then how does this relate to existing merchant solutions, right? So we talked about addresses and given a private key, 
you can generate a public key, a public key generates an address, and then you can receive money as a merchant from that address. And so um, there was a really famous uh, merchant, entrepreneur. Um, he was at a football game, and he has a sign that says, Hi, Mom, send Bitcoin. And so this QR code represents his address, right? And so this is like an address that starts with one. So it means it just represents like a public key. So he has some sort of private key, public key, and then this address. And then he had, he actually got 22 bit. Right? But what's the problem with this, this existing merchant solution? Well, one, he was, there's only one address, and so he had a bunch of different customers paying to this address, so he can't reach out and send thank you notes to his customers. Like, all those donors, he can't thank, he doesn't know exactly who it is. And then, the other really big thing, single um, piece of money or piece of uh, Bitcoin that was moved to this address, and so that's a big problem as a business, right? You don't want to just have your bank account open. You don't want people to know how much uh, revenue you're receiving and how much money you're receiving. And so, yeah, that, those are two big problems with this existing uh, merchant solution. Okay. So then, there are the, so some, some companies came in. My company, Coinbase, we have an existing merchant tools program, and then uh, BitPay is like the biggest one, right? But a lot of people, this is kind of hard to understand, but these are custodial solutions. And so you see that there's an address right here that says send exactly 0 0.025 BTC to this address. So as a customer, for every checkout, there's a unique address that no one has ever seen, so no address reuse. And what Coinbase does for the merchant is it monitors that address and it says, okay, you have 15 minutes to create this transaction. Any money sent to this address within that 15 minutes, we're going to assume that this customer is the one that paid for it, right? And so we monitor the blockchain, we see money sent to that address, and then we say, okay, merchant, treehouse, please release your basic plan with over a thousand plus videos to this customer. Um, and so then there's money at this address but the merchant doesn't have the private key to the address, so they don't actually hold the, the funds. Like They don't own that specific UTXO at that address. Coinbase does. So what Coinbase says is, okay, well, 0 0.025 BTC received, so our, we have 0 0.025 BTC more than before, and then next to the merchant's account, we're just gonna say plus 0 0.025 BTC, but there's no relationship between this address and the merchant. And so this is a custodial solution because Coinbase holds all your funds. And you know, hopefully you can trust BitPay and Coinbase to release your funds back to you eventually, but you're still trusting this, this intermediary. And it also means that there's all these KYC rules and we can only serve customers in certain countries, et cetera. Okay, so, so we're, not, we're not there yet. So we have some custodial cryptocurrency payment processors. And so um, to get to this non-custodial version, we had to talk about hierarchical deterministic wallets. And so HD wallets, oh, okay, here's a joke. Uh, where does an Eskimo keep his Bitcoins? In, in a cold wallet, yeah, in cold storage. <laughs> All right, so, um, so let's start with what is a wallet? And so I really wish that we hadn't used the word wallet when we started this whole cryptocurrency thing because I think the word wallet is the wrong model for how to think about it. So you think of a wallet as like, you know, this physical thing that you put coins in, you put bills into, you put your credit cards in. It's a thing that holds your money. But actually in Bitcoin and in cryptocurrency in general, a wallet does not hold your money. What holds your money? The blockchain, right? So account balances are tracked on the blockchain. They're recorded on this public ledger. What a wallet is, is actually a keychain. It's holding all of your private keys. So earlier, we talked about how each private key is a way to spend your money, right? So addresses is how you receive money. Um, uh, keys are how you spend your money. And so a wallet helps you keep track of all your private keys, spend your money, and uh, keep, help you know what your balances are on the blockchain. Um, and so the original wallet was called a Jabak wallet, um, just a bunch of keys. So all these keys were non-deterministically uh, generated, which means that they had no relationship to each other. And that's what the original Bitcoin core wallet was. The HD wallet was introduced with uh, the Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 39. 
And so what it does, does is introduce this concept of an extended public key. So an extended public key is your, your key pair before that we talked about, your private key plus your public key. So it's this uh, public key plus a chain code, which is used just for some like deterministic randomness. And then you take those two numbers together, and then that is your extended public key. And so with this extended public key, you can generate um, two billion, well, act four billion more, more uh, public keys. And then we know that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between a public key and an address. So what that means is that with one extended public key, you can basically generate an infinite number of addresses that can all be spent using the same private key. So this is, this is exciting. So right, you have your seed, that's your, that's your private key. Um, and then you have your master key. And from that, you can generate families of keys. And uh, let's say you have two children keys. You can't tell that they have the same parent, but you can still spend them with the same private key. And um, so actually, a lot of people haven't heard of the term extended public key. They haven't heard of HD wallets. But all of the wallet solutions out there right now are HD wallets. So I think a lot of you will recognize this interface. So when you first set up your Electrum wallet, your copay wallet, what they'll do is say, OK, um, make your backup recovery phrase. And so what this is, is it's um, 11 random words. And they basically hash some numbers together to a dictionary. And there's like, a small set of number of words that work. And then the 12 words like a checksum. So these 12 words represent your private key. Like this is your password that allows you to spend funds, right? And so what the wallet is doing is um, the ones that like, don't actually have your money in them, what they do is you have this key, and then they keep your extended public key. And based on the extended public key, they can keep track of all your wallet, your, um, your addresses for you, and generate all these addresses without having to store one private key for every address that you have. And so then, um, where does this apply to our non-custodial payment processor? So, uh, so I work at Coinbase Commerce, and so what we do is um, we what we can do with this extended public key is we can separate the ability to receive from funds from the ability to spend your funds. And so your private key is something that only the merchant has. Coinbase Commerce has no idea what your private key is. So if you lose your private key, you've also lost control of your funds, right? And so you give us your extended public key, which is totally separate from your private key. And from that, we can generate as many addresses as we need for you. So every time a customer shows up at your checkout, we can pull out one of your addresses that you control, show it to the customer, check the blockchain for you to see when that customer has paid, and then tell you, oh, okay, the customer has paid, you have controlled your funds, but you should probably release the good to the customer. And in this way, we have reduced, eliminated the overhead of running a server for a merchant while still having, um, giving the merchant total control of their funds. Um, yeah, and so uh, I was trying to come up with like an equivalent analogy, right? Like it's not like Stripe, it's not like PayPal. It's like PayPal because there's like a little widget that shows up and you can like send money to it. But it's literally like the equivalent of handing cash over the web browser from the, the customer directly to the merchant. Um, and so I think this is really exciting. I think that there's a lot more that can be done in this space, but I think it brings us a lot closer to the idea of like in cryptocurrency, you can be your own bank. So I'm really excited to see what happens next. Um, and then, uh, okay, and tonight Coinbase is sponsoring a women's networking event. Um, women and allies, welcome. So I hope to meet some of you there tonight. Um, and uh, reach out to me for questions.